So this is really a case of where big data, big genomic data meets high performance computing. And we really couldn't do these problems uh, without Blue Waters as well as the NVIDIA GPUs that are on those and uh, on my own uh, clusters. So you, I know you all know these other methods of uh, modeling biological systems. They are uh, been all been championed. Some of these methods even received Nobel Prizes recently. But they have sort of their area of, of applications, like subcellular structures. They have time steps of femtoseconds. You go over to Brownian dynamics. Maybe you speed it up with picoseconds. But you're staying in sort of this subcellular regime. If you want to simulate host cells and get up to colonies of cells, then you've got to work in that regime from the micron up to the millimeter range. And I'll show you two examples that we've done. In losing sort of atomic detail and speeding things up, so our time steps are now going to be microseconds, we will discretize the space, putting a small lattice onto it. When we're looking at single cells, those are nanometers in size sublattices. When we go to colonies of cells, our lattices are like 10 microns. But this does allow us to go up and simulate uh, for an entire hour or cell or large part of the cell cycle, or in the case of colonies, up to 30 hours of, uh, of the life of a cell or a colony of cells. So you're, you're giving up, as I said, resolution, but you're gaining the ability to talk about also reactions, which are not handled easily in these other methods. But you're also using a probabilistic approach to describe the state of the cell. So that by that I mean if P stands for the probability, X is a really big vector, represents all the proteins, metabolites, RNA that you're considering in your problem. And if it were really well stirred, like we use sometimes when we solve the chemical master equation, then you would write down this simple set of equations that take you out of the state that you want to be in, uh, be in and reactions that take you from other states into that state, the X state. Trouble is the cell is anything but well stirred. Uh, you see a picture here of a bacterial cell. This is E. coli. You're seeing the architecture. Uh, it's very noisy, very crowded. There's a nucleoid region, DNA, there. Do you, you know where the genes are uh, the, on, on the DNA. Um, here you're seeing the gray dots are some of the largest crowders. Those are ribosomes. And this information, even to set up the simulation, comes in from experiments. And that's in part why we also developed our lattice microbes software, is we wanted to be able to incorporate all the available data, use it to set up the system, and then also to try to validate our predictions. So what you're seeing here is data from a cryo-EM that was a Baumeister in Germany. Uh, these distributions of ribosomes has also been seen by uh, Sunny uh, she, Johann Elf in Sweden, and, and Tom Kuhlman in my place. The painting of the systems done by like Murner. And if you're going to do kinetics, like look at the assembly of the ribosome, you really need a lot of experimental data, and that we take from Jamie Williamson. So to these reactions, we add now a diffusion component. So things will be diffusing in and out of those regions, whether it's on the membrane or in the nucleoid region. So you have this operator down here, and I want to remind you the cell is really packed. And we have proteomics data to back that up, as well as the imaging data. All right, so here are some of the problems that we've done. We started off by looking at a Wells known system. It's called the LAC genetic switch. It was rather modest uh, in that it only had like 23, 24 reactions, maybe 10 species. And now we're down here and doing ribosome biogenesis. We have 1,200 reactions. We start with the transcription event of the operons for the rRNA as well as the proteins. We translate the proteins. We look at the assembly of the ribosomes. And then we can compare that to experiments. This is only including the translational network. What we'd like to do is add to it the metabolic network, which we also have done, but in a separate uh, sim set of simulation, it too has around 2,000 reactions. And, uh, and depending on what comes into these cells, and maybe in the colony where, where they are in the cell, that's going to affect the uptake rates, and then what part of the network gets used, and then what the cells secrete. As I said, this is invaluable. You see the clock ticking here. That's actually the minutes of a cell cycle is about 60 minutes. And we can only do this with using the, the NVIDIA GPUs. So quick 
uh, summary. We want to put in crowding and all the information that is available to us on protein RNA distributions. It comes from cryo-electron tomography, single molecule, RNA-seq data, proteomics. When we do kinetics there, we're, most of the time it involves a shift from small to large numbers. We're going to use the reaction diffusion master equation. Parameters are going to be very important. There's a 20 years of histories of biochemistry helping us there. And then how do we modify what we've done up here to be able to go from one cell to millions of cells. And if you're interested in the site, the work, uh, this is an overnight success since 2009. Uh, and uh, our latest work that I'll talk about uh, is from a BMC article and one that was uh, recently submitted, is under review. So first, why do we look at the ribosome biogenesis? It is the penultimate um, universal process uh, that's not my statement, that's from Carl Vos, who used the ribosomal RNA. In particular, he used the RNA, which is shown here in yellow, uh, to make this tree of life that's used by biologists to classify all organisms. And he looked for signature regions along that, the sequence of the 16S. It is held together with a, these brown objects, these proteins, there's about 20 of them. And for years, we did more on the molecular dynamics side, trying to figure out what was the importance of these signatures. Now we want to look at how we can help build up a kinetic model, and we can always go back to molecular dynamics if there's something that comes up in the assembly process that we think needs to be further studied. So here's the assembly. Remember, yellow is the RNA, brown are the proteins. There are roughly 20 of them. This could lead to, if we're totally arbitrary, how to assemble two to the 20th states. But thank God we know from experiments already from uh, Nomura in Japan for over 20 or 30 years, that there's a hierarchical assembly. Uh, some proteins need to bind directly to the RNA. Once they're bound, then the secondary proteins can bind, and then the tertiary. That leads a reduction from 2 to the 20th to about 1,600 states. So if you look at like the RNA, and you had possibility of three proteins binding, say two were primary, one was secondary, you'd say, no, no, for this guy, and that knocks out a lot of the states and gets you to that 1,600. So we'd like to explain how do we get to this distribution of ribosomes that has now been seen by three different experimental methods. And everything I will talk to you about will be for slow-growing E. coli. The picture changes if you have fast-growing systems. And further complication of this is the fact that the DNA has not one copy of the ribosomal genes, but seven. So first, how do we get rates for that? We uh, work together with one of the leading um, uh, ribosome people out in Scripps. His name is Jamie Williamson. He did a series of pulse chase experiments where you uh, throw in naked RNA or naked RNA with some other proteins. The bottom line is you're seeing 1,600 here, but we f even that was too many for us for our cell simulations. We wanted to reduce it as much as possible. So those uh, intermediates that had low population we took out, so we got it to 145. And what you need to compare is the green with the dotted line, which is the experiment. This was our model for assembly. Now we have to put it into our in silico model of biogenesis that starts with uh, the transcription of the seven operons. They're just operons for the rRNA, additional operons for the, mess for the proteins. And the lattice spacing we're using here is 32 nanometers. This is a typical slow-growing cell. I think you saw the dimensions before. This is the initial states of these things. And we'll take away the center region uh, part of it so you can look into the nucleoid. These would be where those operons are sitting on the DNA. And now we let the process go. First we look at the small subunits, the large subunits, then the fully intact ones that are translating. And we look at the first couple uh, I think first couple minutes, because the assembly part of the new ones goes very quickly. So you'll see little blips here of where translation of the messenger RNA for the proteins begins and where it ends. The clock is ticking. As I said, this is only, unlike the other ones, went up to an hour. This We're just trying to show you the initial growth. And then you can also look, uh, put the intermediates in various categories and look at them as well. We did this for over a whole hour to get an, an idea about where do you find them on average, what things can actually be treated almost mean field, and you see the results here. So 
what we're watching, here is a function of time, here is the circular DNA, these red marks indicate the seven rRNA operons. So we were looking at just, say, the initial formulation of a, a new small subunit here, and you'll see it goes up to a couple thousand. Now, now over 60 minutes here. We could check this with our collaborators, Tom Kuhlman, who actually goes and measure how many ribosomes um, come from each of those seven operons. We were working in a region that's about here, 120 minutes doubling times, so between the 60 and the 120. And here you see the results from an experiment, single molecule experiments called STORM, where you label the ribosomes coming just from that one gene, and you see there's about a thousand of them. So it compares very well. In all honesty, we underestimate some of the ones coming from the others. Okay, now to do those simulations, uh, our code, as I said, is, has been built from the get-go uh, using the GPU technology, and we were already <coughs> anticipating or uh, the hope that we would have more multi-GPU systems. So in 2014, we wrote an article that has now been rather well cited <laughs> in parallel computing to look at the speed up you get as you start using multiple GPUs. So this uh, graph is here, has volume down here, so this would be roughly where you'd find E. coli, this would be yeast, and this would be like a red blood cell. And, and this is like uh, how many days we have to compute to get one hour of that organism. So it was about, you had to compute a day to get an hour of E. coli, not very good. As we went over though, after supercomputing and got to try out the new K40s, uh, on cirrus scale, the whole curve sank here, and so now we can get for this particular benchmark uh, within fractions of a day, uh, uh, an hour uh, within, yeah, within a fraction of a day, an hour of E. coli. And now, just to give you the results, say, for, um, for Blue Waters, it has K20s, as you all know, and unfortunately, it is running CUDA 5. Please improve that or update it if the CUDA people are here. Okay, really? Yeah, now. Oh, take all <laughs> this back then, right? <laughs> all right, because uh, then we went home and I had a little local cluster that has 980s running 6.5, and then going to these secret top meetings that NVIDIA has um, uh, that said, oh, some of those uh, functionality is going to come out in CUDA 7. We applied them, and let me show you what happens here. So this is how much time it would take to run all the reaction kernel on the 1,200 reactions for uh, ribosome biogenesis, and it goes like this on Blue Waters. And then we use this new feature called like just-in-time-like code where you generate a code that, yeah, yeah, fantastic stuff. All right, and then you get another factor of three. So everything we do, it, it gets an improvement. And, if, and a lot of this just comes about going to the next version of the CUDA. All right. Now, why do we want to hurry up our code so much? It's because we only got half the problem there. We're, th these are all the proteins that are in a system, in a, a bacterial cell, look about, what is that, third or half, or translation. The other parts are in metabolism. So we've got this model going. We've looked at this, but we want to combine the two. That's a lot of reactions. And right now, we're getting about three microseconds for that whole reaction uh, kernel. And you know the students just don't want to compute forever and ever. So we want to combine this problem, which we've already looked at, at solving for the, um, looking at reaction and diffusion of metabolites around these cells. That changes the input and exchange rates coming into the cell. But we solve that steady state then, because there's just so many reactions at this time to do. So then we look like, oh, does that amount of glucose coming in at this steady state, make us the cells secrete acetate? Or uh, how much oxygen can the cells take up? Are they seeing different oxygens in the middle or in the outside? And now, th that was only with about 100 to 200 cells. We wanted to get up to a million, so we changed the algorithms a bit in that we no longer do the diffusion of the substrates because we have high enough concentrations. We just treat those with the, a diffusion equation that alters the environment around our cells changes the input into these networks, and, but out of this network, we get steady state fluxes and a growth rate, which indicates how 
uh, what happens to the cells in each of these little lattice sites, which are now 10 microns and holding tens of, of bacteria, it starts pushing them out into the neighboring cells. And if we look at this, here's a result. I do want to point out, this was a prediction. DOE and in wisdom, because I complained that I couldn't get anybody to validate our prediction, gave me money to hire an experimental postdoc. So we predicted this, and then he went and measured this. And so what we did, almost done, we put in a two-colored plasmid into the system, one that should report uh, here if we're taking up glucose. That would be this red part here. It's called M-cherry. And another reporter system that should report if it's utilizing acetate. Right? And now let's take a look, as he did with a microscope using optical sectioning. He looked at the base, so he should be seeing the red primarily, and the little maybe a ring of green around it. Let's go to the top of that colony. And now, he, hey, what happened to that thing? Oh, all right, now he goes to the top of that colony and he sees only green. He sees the green fluorescence. So this really validated our prediction. So the bottom line is not us developing these network models. That's again another 20 years of systems biology people, biochemistry people, have provided us with the rates. They're sitting off in a database that hardly anybody knows about because it's sitting in Germany, but, uh, and they mispronounce the name of it all the time. But, okay, <laughs> it's there. And now we want to combine the transcription, translation, uh, with the metabolic systems because our grand design is to have all the universal processes in there so we can change the local environment, look at the network for signaling, regulation, metabolism, translation, and look at the cellular responses. That's a tall goal, very mighty, but I think we're closer than, I think we're very close. We just need update <laughs> the GPUs, and these are the people who are gonna do it. Uh, and uh, these are some of my colleagues at the University of Illinois. That's Tom Kuhlman. There's Tay Kip Ha, he's a single molecule fellow uh, that provides us also with data about the dynamics of the ribosome folding, and the rest of these, these are colleagues. The imaging is so important to get the architecture correct. This is Baumeister and Elizabeth Vila, who developed the technique of focus ion beam milling of cells so we could get real pictures of what the cellular environment looks like. And these are the students that were mentioned and programmers from our NIH center, um, as well as my own uh, research programmer, Mike Halleck, who works uh, on our, uh, trying to accelerate everything we do with our, our Lattice Microbe software. And we really are indebted to all the help and advice that we get both from Blue Waters and from uh, uh, NVIDIA. Okay, thank you. You got a couple minutes for questions? Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, Bill. Yeah, okay, so there's the really pretty picture, which is the real biology, which says, really, there are this many proteins, and roughly, so let's say they're all involved in one to two reactions. So it's, we've done sort of the 1,200 reactions down, excuse me, up here, I'm pointing at my laptop, uh, uh, involved in translation, and then there's another, oh, anywhere from 1,600 to 2,000. Turns out many of these metabolic pathways, if you impose the regulation, like if you're looking at a cell under anaerobic conditions, you can throw away half of them. But it's like 1,200 for a reduced description here. It's gonna be another 1,600 maybe down here. And we know that it, our code is more or less linear with the number of reactions we do. So that's why we care about that reaction kernel, that we could suddenly, whoom, really change the slope by the just-in-time so compilation. Yeah, 
translation is, 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 is really is just about, you know, reading the messengers and then, uh, so you're transcribing the, the DNA and then you're translating the messengers for the proteins. So that's why we only have half the proteins there because we only did the ribosomal proteins. So there's another half missing. So we have all the, re we have the reactions here, right? Uh, we need to add some here, like the charging of the tRNA. Um, so it's not exactly six, you know, adding 1,200 and 1,600. We've already made uh, some progress, but we just haven't been able to unite them yet. We solved one problem and used time scale separation because metabolism adjusts much more slowly than making a, a, a single small subunit. That's like a minute. The others are take longer for the cell to respond. But if you want to do it and have cells under more realistic conditions, like really a time varying um, environment, then you really do want to have both. But I think also we will be combining different methodologies. There's no real reason as you get to very large numbers that you have to keep on using a stochastic master equation. That's there to get the noise. And they can measure the more noise on stochastic gene expression, but once you get into some of the meta uh, metabolic networks, it's not clear to me you keep on needing the master equation formulation.